Let me have you turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 10. We're going to take a look at a familiar passage of Scripture. If you're on the church email list, you saw I, I sent out yesterday that um, we're still heading toward a study in the book of Habakkuk, but with uh, today being a, a short Sunday, so to speak, as far as sleep is concerned, and then with Resurrection Sunday coming up soon, uh, we're going to take just a few more weeks and, and then begin that study after Resurrection Sunday. This morning, we're looking at a familiar passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37. A lot of people think of this as the parable of the good Samaritan. Uh, I like to call it the parable of the compassionate Samaritan. Uh, we've gone to this passage uh, a number of years ago, but this morning I especially wanted to think about this passage because of the current times in which we live and perhaps some of the temptations that we have where compassion and evangelism might be concerned. So this morning we're going to look at some evangelistic lessons from the parable of the compassionate Samaritan. Now when you come to this parable, it's important for us to understand the backdrop because um, if we simply include this in uh, a, ch a children's storybook, there can be a tendency for us to simply come away thinking, well, we should be compassionate like the Good Samaritan. But there's a lot more going on here. We have a man who's actually trying to catch the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, a crafty, well-educated man who's trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ here. And it's in that context that this parable comes out in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Which you will see as we proceed this morning that that question was actually a pretty complicated question in that climate. Follow along as I read. I'm going to start by reading um, Luke 10, 25 through 37. So join me here as I read Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for your word and for this opportunity that we have now to be hearers of the word. And we would ask, Lord, that you would grant us the grace of being doers of the word as well. Lord, help us to understand this passage and help us to, to live it, especially in this day in which we live, that we would be those who love you with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it's true, when you look at this passage, uh, one of the main things that the Lord Jesus is doing is addressing the attitude of the scribe who is trying to catch Christ. 
And Jesus is trying to teach him the real truth of his kingdom, that it's not just about these external things, and we'll look at that more in a few moments. It's not about some keepable, um, twisted law that they came up with, but rather Jesus is pushing this scribe to come to the end of himself and realize that he needed a righteousness which was not his own. In the process, Jesus also teaches us something about what true hearts for God look like in having a heart for God and a heart for man or loving our neighbor as ourselves. I wanted to come back to this parable and think about it with you this morning. And part of the reason is the current climate of our nation. Now, I don't know about you. You know, you have different relationships than I do, different personality, different experiences. So not everything that I say might fit everyone. But it seems like the current climate in our nation has made evangelism a bit more difficult in some ways. You have COVID tensions that have made it harder to evangelize because of all the physical distancing and, and all of that. I think that's changing, that's getting, you know, opening up. Some people have talked about having different kinds of opportunities even during this time. But I think in general, COVID tension has not really made us develop closer relationship and more intimacy with people we don't know. It has caused us to keep our distance oftentimes. But then you throw in the racial tension and the political tension that also marks our day where it's hard for people to even have a, a, a human conversation with one another. And I think that that, that has made it more difficult to evangelize because of some of these cultural reasons. There's a, a growing animosity toward biblical Christianity and the truth of Scripture. So there might be more of a likelihood that people are actually going to get upset, get in your face, get angry, simply with you presenting the one way, the one truth, the one life that no one comes to the Father except through him. That is a message where Jesus would say, they're going to hate you because they hated me. The very message itself that there is one way is offensive. You have a growing difficulty in communicating in an age where yelling seems to be more prevalent than truly listening. And I wonder, I wonder if there's a, a subtle but growing desire to hunker down and just take care of our own. I, I don't know, have you felt that? I, I know when some of this was first breaking loose, I think that the prepper in me started coming out. I began thinking about, you know, if the mobs start, you know, coming down the street, how am I going to take care of my family kind of a thing? You know, if there are food shortages and that kind of stuff. I mean, it runs through your mind as you think about all, all that we've been through. That's a little bit more of a distant memory now, but back, you know, last April, some of those thoughts seemed a lot more real. Well, I think in the church as well, when, when danger comes, there can be a tendency for us perhaps to, to kind of, you know, circle the wagons and take care of one another. And, and that's not all bad, obviously, taking care of one another. But what we don't want to do in the process is lock the doors, so to speak, on the church. I think about the instruction that we're given to, um, to do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So there is a prioritization of saints taking care of one another. There is a prioritization within the family of God, but that same command says, do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So perhaps you've noticed, I, I think I've seen this in my own heart, where the last year, a lot of it has felt like we got to take care of one another, and that's good. But at the same time, as evil rages around in our society and we're taking care of ourselves, there can be perhaps a subtle danger of just kind of like locking the doors, you know, like, well, okay, I guess this is it. This is who we are. And, and I don't think that that's the attitude. In fact, if you kind of rewind back through history, there has often been trouble. It's, it's more the norm that Christians have faced various kinds of trouble whether it's the trouble of a pandemic or the trouble of a wicked and evil society that has completely walked away from God's truth in every which way you can imagine. That's been more the norm. So when we read the scriptures and we see how it is we are to interact with other people, that is not just in good times. That's assuming that normally there's going to be a measure of difficulty in this fallen world. Well, holding to the doctrines of grace and 
believing in a God who is sovereign in salvation, I, I believe actually motivates us to evangelism. First of all, it means we believe in a, a big God who is worthy of glory, who is worthy of having more worshipers of his great name. But also because we believe that no one seeks after God by nature, but that God will save his people, we believe that God has ordained the use of means to bring his people in, and we are often going to be the primary means of bringing those people in. Election, the doctrine of election, means that hardened sinners will repent and believe, not primarily because of our skill, but because of God's sovereign goodness. But God has ordained the use of means. He has used the preaching of the word and the sharing of the word in personal testimony and personal evangelism. He has ordained the means to bring them in. So as we go forth in evangelism, we remember God's sovereign reign of grace. We remember our dependence on the Holy Spirit and his essential role in regeneration, in conversion. We remember our need for prayer as we go about these things, but we take confidence that God is going to do a work because he's the one that has said he will, and these are the things that he'll use to do it. Now, this morning, we're looking at this parable. Let's, let's uh, take a look at this parable, but especially I want us to remember here um, how it is we are to think of those who are very different from us, and perhaps by nature even where there's some maybe animosity marking the relationship. Because you'll notice in the parable that Jesus gives in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? He uses an illustration of uh, two people that naturally would, ha- would kind of be at odds with one another. And part of the beauty of that example is there are so many parallels with that and people that we might encounter in the world today where we don't see things the same way that they do. Maybe they don't even know the Lord and they have very different perspectives and a very different worldview. And yet we're taught something here of what it means to love others with the love of Christ. So what you have here is this law expert or this scribe who, who is an expert in the law of Moses, which is kind of ironic because he doesn't even really have a true heart for God, but he's an expert in the Pentateuch and the Torah. Well, the job of a, of a law expert in the time of Christ was to, to basically study the law and explain it to others. So this involved things like understanding the law, copying it, interpreting it, expounding on it, but oftentimes the problem is that they did it in light of human tradition. So without a heart for God, the process would go something like this. Um, Let's take the the Torah and then let's apply it, interpret it in such a way that we actually have a keepable standard. We kind of lower the bar and then maybe we could get by with a righteousness that is our own. And that seems to have been the approach. So the scribe's uh, job was to understand the law, teach it to others, and then apply it in a legal context. So these scribes or lawyers actually, you know, had somewhat of that function as well, like a modern day lawyer. Well, so you immediately figure this guy is educated and this guy is sharp and he knows the law. Well, right from the beginning, we know his motives are not good because um, Luke records that this lawyer stood up and tested Christ. This man who was known for his ability to handle the law in religious and social disputes in a public setting tries to embarrass Jesus and catch him being a rebel in some way, some way that they could accuse. Not only does verse 25 say that he stood up and tested him, but verse 29 says he wanted to justify himself instead of responding humbly to Christ. It's pretty clear here that the law experts' motives were wicked. So he asks this question to teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Or to, to put it another way, to obtain possession of everlasting life. It's a good question. Because essentially we're saying, how, how do I get life that is both endless and priceless? Well, for those who really want an answer to that question and come to God in repentance and faith, They will find the forgiveness that only comes through Jesus. Eternal life is 
the peace of God that is beyond our understanding. Eternal life is the joy of God that cannot be expressed. Eternal life is the fellowship with God that starts now and will continue without sin in glory forever. But Jesus needed the lawyer to understand something because of the lawyer's heart and what it was he was trying to do. Jesus had other things that needed to happen, things that needed to take place in that man's mind and heart. So Jesus answers the question with a question. Well, what's written in the law? What's your reading of it? There were a lot of people at this time that were really concerned that, well, Jesus was teaching things contrary to the law. But the problem really was not with Jesus' teaching at all. Jesus' teaching was perfect. The problem was with the fact that the Jews had added so much human tradition to God's law that it was often barely recognizable in its final application. And it made me think, you know, even like today, back then, the sufficiency and the inerrancy of Scripture was of vital importance. It was being attacked then by adding things to it, which it ended up twisting the meaning of Scripture. And of course, today, it's under constant attack as people continue to say, that's not actually what God said to us. So Jesus says, what's your reading of the law? And and he gives this response. It's a good response. Um, It's a biblical response. It's, It's what you could expect from a law expert. He essentially quotes from Mosaic law, from Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Shema, and from Leviticus 19, 18. And he quotes those two together. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And... This is the part from Leviticus 19, 18. Your neighbor as yourself. Well, we know, we, we've seen, we've heard that language before. We know that's crucial. It's basically a summary of the law. It's a summary of the first and the second tables of the law. Uh, the first table of the law, we refer to it as the first table being those first four commandments concerning our relationship with God. And the second table of the law are the, the next six commandments concerning our relationship with man. Christ himself referred to the law in this way in Matthew 22 and Mark 12. So it's kind of a summary of the law, the the two tables of the law. Love God, love my neighbor. Love God completely and love man as much as I love myself and in a similar way. Well, uh, there was a serious problem in Jewish culture, and that was that instead of being humbled by our complete and utter lack of ability to obey God's law perfectly. Over time, the religious leaders had interpreted it in such a way as to make it almost doable. (laughs) And yet it was a burden that no man could bear. So they would focus on the outward appearance. They would focus on performance. They would focus on things like, well, I've never actually murdered someone, but let's not talk about hate. That's why Jesus drew those things out as he taught. He said, let's not just talk about outward murder. Let's talk about the murder of hatred in the heart. But they would focus on those outward things instead of the heart issues and the need for a righteousness that is not our own. So think of it like this. If loving God is a series of rituals or, you know, I get to pick who my neighbor is, then I've got a chance at perfect obedience. The problem is the Pharisees were known for despising their fellow man and excusing themselves from hard acts of love. We don't know for sure, but lawyers were quite commonly, maybe most commonly Pharisees, sometimes Sadducees. There's a good chance this man was a Pharisee. And that was their perspective, (laughs) really despising other people that weren't like them and excusing themselves from actually loving in the ways that hurt or were difficult. You see, if love for God and neighbor is a thoughtful and purposeful commitment to place God above all else in my heart, if loving my fellow man like I love myself means doing it regardless of how I feel, I begin to realize how far short I fall 
when I think of the standard that Jesus set before us and, and not just some man-made, man, uh, man-made twisted version of it. So really, it's an impossible challenge Jesus sets forth. He says, okay, good answer. Now go do that. Good. But what Jesus is actually specifically addressing is the need of this law expert's heart. Exposing the self-righteousness and and teaching him the depth and the fullness and the spiritual nature of the Mosaic law. Jesus is saying, if anyone can perfectly obey this law from their hearts in every detail, eternal life would be theirs. The problem was not with the law. But we, we know what else Christ taught not too far after the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Which was another way of saying is that there is no human earthly righteousness that suffices when it comes to standing before a holy God. I mean, this guy was a scribe. I mean, in this, by, by this time, these law experts and scribes are essentially the same guy. So this, we could call this guy a scribe, very possibly a Pharisee. And Jesus teaches that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. He's teaching an impossible challenge. The nature of the righteousness that's needed in his kingdom, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this exchange is not going according to plan. Jesus was the one who was supposed to be embarrassed. In fact, you know, with this, this law expert, if he had the, you know, the, uh, the guts to do this publicly with Jesus, I wonder what kind of a guy he was, you know, in life. Was he, he was one of those guys always picking some sort of argument, you know, back in school or something? Because clearly he had talent, he had education, and it seems like he has a certain kind of a spirit where he's willing to go toe-to-toe. He's probably not used to this. This is not what he thought it was going to be like when he started out trying to embarrass the Lord Jesus Christ. So wanting to justify himself, wanting to make himself appear righteous, he says to Jesus, man, who is my neighbor? Now you have to understand, and some of you have I think have heard me explain this somewhat before, but you have to understand that when this man, this law expert asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? That's on par with one of you asking somebody else after the service, so who did you vote for in November? (laughs) It's along those lines. It's just innately volatile and kind of distracting from the things that matter the most, but a really fun conversation for some people for a time at least. Well, See, the Jews had all kinds of opinions about who my neighbor is. And when you're not concerned about the most important things, what do we tend to do? We tend to waste time arguing to no profit. Well, remember, the Jews were constantly twisting God's law, adding to it or reinterpreting it, so that instead of God's law revealing their own sin, it actually ended up fueling their own self-righteousness by allowing them keepable commands. Something that wouldn't violate their selfish, sinful desires. It's clear from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, that where we were recently when we looked at Blessed Are Those Who Mourn. It's clear from that sermon that it was common for many Jews to interpret Leviticus 19.18 as meaning things like this. Uh, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You remember quite, Christ quoted them on that? He said, some of you teach this. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, and Jesus refutes that perversion of his law. But there were various teachings out there like that. I mean, some would teach, love your neighbor, the Israelite. Do we have any parallels in the church? The Pharisees were even more arrogant, where their attitude was, love your neighbor, the Pharisee. Love your fellow Pharisees. There were separatists, in the Qumran community that thought that anyone who was not a part of their group was a son of darkness and should be hated. You see, by asking the question, who is my neighbor? Uh, 
the law expert thought he could deflect the attention away from his own conscience and try to show Jesus up. It was a volatile question. It was a distracting question. And he probably thought pretty much anything that Jesus says is going to be wrong. By the way, do you ever feel that way nowadays? When you have a conversation with people about different topics that no matter what you say, you're going to be wrong? Well, that was the hope of this law expert here as he is trying to expose Christ. Well, so when he asks, who is my neighbor, that's where we get the parable of the Good Samaritan or the parable of the Compassionate Samaritan. And Jesus tells this following parable. So there's this guy, it seems like he's implied to be a Jew, most likely, and he's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is a bit of a rough journey. It, there, it drops somewhere between three and 4,000 feet, probably about 18 miles long, and it would take you probably eight hours to walk it. it and I imagine that's if you're, you know, in decent shape, although uh, a lot of people walked in that day. But because of the terrain, with all of the ruggedness and the hills and the caves, it was a place that was known to be a bit of a hiding place at times for criminals. And Jesus' listeners would have understood that. This was a bit of a dangerous road, maybe a road that you wouldn't want to walk on by yourself that often, but the people in Christ's day would have, would have understood what this road was. Well, you guys know this. You kids know this, don't you? You know, you know how this goes. The man in the story is surrounded and outnumbered by robbers. He's stripped of his clothes and certainly, I'm sure, of anything else that he had that was of value, and they beat him up in the process. And so when they left him, he was in bad shape, unable to continue on his own. In fact, the, the New King James, doesn't it say half dead? And then, of course, and again, you, you kids know this, don't you? you? Maybe you've even role-played this one before. You have different people that are perhaps on their way back from worshiping at the temple. Maybe going back to Jericho, where a lot of them lived when they weren't on duty. So it was not uncommon to have priests and Levites on their way home from temple worship back down to uh, Jericho, where they would have lived when they weren't actually serving. So the first person who passes this man is a priest. So here you have a man of God, supposedly, a, a spiritual leader engaged in the sacred activities of worship in the temple, ignoring a dying man lying on the side of the road, a fellow Jew. Well, showing mercy was one of the most basic and important aspects of God's law. Israelites were taught personally to show mercy to strangers and to enemies as well as to other Israelites. But for whatever reason, this priest did not want to get involved. Again, it sounds like the predominant culture of the day was having lips that draw close and hearts that are far away. Having a semblance of religion, but not actually a heart for God. Well, next comes the Levite who would have been more like a temple helper. He was probably also heading back home after ministering for a period of time in the temple, and he did the same thing. Passed by on the other side of the road. Now, you have to remember, this is a parable. So parables, in a sense, were made up, but parables also were stories that were full of real life. And so even though Jesus is kind of pulling this story together, Every one of these scenarios in this account, in this parable, are likely to be common occurrences and things that the listeners had seen and experienced in their lives many times before. But I wonder how many of them had seen this. The third person to come by, of course, was the Samaritan. Now let's take a moment. We've, we've talked about Samaritans through the years, but let's just take a moment and remember who they were and why they were so despised. See, not only were they what you might call a mixed breed, but the Samaritans themselves were a symbol of one of the worst events in Jewish history. 
the exile. You see, when many Israelites were taken into captivity in Assyria, the king of Assyria, when the, when the northern ten tribes you know, were taken into captivity, the king of Assyria brought Gentiles from places like Babylon and quite a few other places and relocated them in the cities of Samaria in the place of the exiled Jews. So the Jews were taken away from the northern ten tribes of Israel at that time into Assyrian captivity, and Gentiles were brought in to kind of inhabit the land while the Jews were taken out of their land. Now give it a little bit of time. All of those Gentile groups ended up mixing with the minority of Jews who remained in the region. Not everybody was taken. And the result was a racially and religiously mixed group out of which grew the Samaritan people and religion. So the Samaritan people were a mix of Jewish and Gentile heritage, and their religious views were skewed. They were not really in line in many ways with the law that had been given to Israel. So in Christ's day, as you can imagine, the Jews hated this heretical group of half-breeds, as they would consider them, and would not interact with them or travel through their region even. They hated them. So here, in Jesus' parable, after a heartless priest and an equally heartless Levite come by, a compassionate Samaritan comes along. And I think it's interesting that in this parable, Jesus has the Samaritan as the one giving the help and being merciful and the Jew in need of the help. Some people might have even thought of this as kind of an oxymoron, a compassionate Samaritan. But Jesus portrays this account like this, that when the Samaritan saw the wounded man, his heart went out to him. He had compassion, and his compassion was deep and genuine. How do you know? Well, he didn't just pat him on the shoulder and say, there, there, I'm sorry that happened to you. No, this hard trip from Jerusalem to Jericho just got a whole lot harder for the Samaritan. First, he starts out by administering first aid. You know, the, uh, the things that are mentioned here in the account, the oil and the wine would have had kind of an antiseptic Im, uh, impact and also a, a bit, be a bit of a balm. So after the first aid, then you have, instead of riding his own animal, he's walking while his new friend, who is half dead, is on his animal, which means it would be harder for the Samaritan and slower than it originally was. Well, then he gets to a place where he can actually buy him lodging, and he does that and personally attends to him the first night, and then when he gets ready to head out the next day to carry on with the purpose of his trip, he gives up what was the equivalent of two days' worth of his own money to make sure that the innkeeper would take care of him with the promise to pay more, if needed, upon his return. So this was an extravagant display of mercy from an unexpected source, and Jesus is trying to make a point to this law expert, and so says, so which of these three <laughs> did, he even, did he even really need to ask, but... You know, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? A fellow Pharisee, a, a priest, a Levite, a Jew? But if they walk right past with hearts that are stony and cold, who's the real neighbor? And the only obvious answer that the law expert could give was he who showed mercy on him. The Samaritan. What? I'm sorry? Well, the answer is obvious. Anyone who needs help, anyone that God providentially places in my path is my neighbor. Now, pause just a sec here because... You know, some of us get overwhelmed with messages like this, right? Because the needs out there are so great. And if you walk away thinking, well, I need to take care of the world, that's exhausting. That's impossible. 
So I think we have to understand that in all of our lives, there are people that if we have our eyes open, very likely, or if we're praying for opportunities, very likely we may come across some who need help. Those that God providentially brings our way. And yes, we have choices to make, and we can't do everything, and we can't uh, save the world. (laughs) But we can be neighbors to the ones that God brings our way. And our neighbors are not necessarily the ones living on this side, that side, across the street, and behind us. Our neighbors, according to this parable, are those who need help, who are providentially placed in our paths. So you could find them in the dorm. You could find them at work. You could find them in the neighborhood. You could find them at the local whatever club or connection you have. I would say certainly in many places throughout our land and all throughout the Miami Valley, there are people like this half-dead Jew, spiritually speaking and physically speaking, in many places. So this is a challenge. Jesus says to him, well, go and do likewise. Go and be like that compassionate Samaritan. Now you see, we could misunderstand this whole passage. When the law expert asks how to have eternal life, Is Jesus saying the answer is, be nice? By the way, parents, be careful how you teach this one to your kids. We don't want to simply moralize our kids and say, be nice like the Samaritan was nice. That's not the gospel. And then the law expert says, okay, a keepable command. I'll have to try a little harder, and I'll try to be nice. No, no. You see, Jesus here is probing the heart, telling him that in order to have eternal life, you would have to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he may very well have been both. In other words, the self-righteousness that comes when you pervert the law of God into something that you can actually keep while you don't really even address the sin in the heart, that doesn't cut it. You can't just be nice to fellow Pharisees or maybe even fellow Jews. You must from the heart show compassion to Samaritans or let Samaritans show compassion to you. And there's something deep down inside that ought to say, I can't. You want to know what it really means to love God with everything that is in you? And to love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus says, here's an example. You see, when Jesus says, go now, Mr. Scribe, Mr. Law Expert, and live this manner of life from the heart, completely and perfectly, for the rest of your days, and you will have eternal life, he wants the response of those listening to be, I can't. Not only can I not do it, I don't want to. I don't even have the desire. I think that would be the desired effect. Not to have the listeners try harder, but to come to the realization that we cannot be justified by the works of the law. It's impossible for us to fulfill the demands of God's law on our own with our own efforts. Rather, after we trust Christ, after we turn from our sin and believe on Him out of love and gratitude to God and empowered by the Holy Spirit supernaturally, we are able to live a life that brings glory to God and we can do things like the compassionate Samaritan. God will give us desires that we did not have before. God will enable us to have the kind of compassion shown by the Samaritan in the parable. We won't do it perfectly, but we will be able to do it significantly, even in this life. Now, one of the thoughts that I've had, and I just want to bring a few thoughts of application as we draw this to a close this morning, especially when you think about this Uh, description that Jesus gives of what loving our fellow man actually looks like by God's grace. I think about 
the challenges that lie around us. You know, it's easy for us to do, have a real quick connection with somebody, maybe give them a little money and wish them Godspeed. It's relatively easy to do that kind of quick transactional type ministry. What's a challenge is to walk day in, day out with other sinners like us, but then also to have an ongoing relationship of mercy with people that are really struggling. So if that's just a novelty for us, that energy is going to be gone pretty quickly. If that sounds like it was the right thing to do, and there's almost a romantic notion to you know, helping people in the city kind of a thing, that's going to go pretty quickly when you see the, the level of hardness and addiction and sin that is often faced. The only thing that will sustain our love for our neighbors is really, I think, our love for God. Those things are going to go together. So the, the, the law, which is summarized by love the Lord your God with all of your heart, kind of pours right into and love your neighbor. And it's going to be hard. If you're lover, loving your neighbor in your own strength, if you're doing it in the flesh, it's not going to last long and it's not going to be all that real. But if it's an outpouring of the love that I have for God, the love that God is shedding abroad in my heart, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in giving me the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ for other people, that is sustained as I abide in the vine and have an ongoing relationship of love for God. See, sacrificial love, like Christ portrays here, which is possible only by His grace, is maintained by cultivating a wholehearted love for God. And I think part of that includes remembering how much I've been forgiven. Which, really, sometimes I think we need to, you know, as we read the Word, as we sing our songs, you know, to make sure that we're thinking about God's grace and mercy to us, to me. Remembering how much I've been forgiven, remembering how large God's mercy has been to me, Having the mind of Christ, this mind which was also in Christ Jesus, of humility and service, pouring himself out on behalf of others, I can only do that if I am being, becoming more Christ-like myself. It's one thing to feel some compassion you know, that causes your heart to go out to a person, but it's a lot harder to help alleviate their misery over time. Now, of course, the gospel, the gospel message of salvation through faith in Christ is at the heart of it. But so often, we're also given illustrations like this. I mean, do you remember before the Sermon on the Mount, we read that passage a number of times, right in the very context of Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom to them? He's also healing people of all kinds of diseases at the same time. Or here... When you're asking, well, who is my neighbor and what does that look like? Jesus gives us the illustration of the compassionate Samaritan who's helping the half-dead Jew. And so the natural relationships that we have, the, the natural gateway, will often be some need or some difficulty that is being faced. Of course, there is really no evangelism until the gospel of Jesus Christ is being shared in some way with specificity and in the truth of scripture but oftentimes it's in the context of actual love being poured out people realizing that and i think especially in our context today with all of the vitriol that's around us today to just have someone who genuinely and warmly is prepared to love them might be kind of shocking in and of itself so I'm not proposing a view where we say we're simply going to just, you know, help heal people and feed people and clothe people and that's it. That's not the end in and of itself. It's simply living out our practical Christianity before the lives of men. Sometimes there's probably a temptation for us to, to be much more compassionate in our own families and in our own churches. Maybe with God's worldwide family of believers. But it's a lot harder when it takes sustained time and effort, perhaps finances and other resources to minister to people. Or think about, what, think about the people you know. When the Lord brings you a neighbor providentially and their lives involve bad relationships, poor teaching, maybe poverty, 
unwanted pregnancies, addiction, maybe a really different culture or worldview, and often destructive life decisions. It's a lot harder to help people like that. It's a lot harder to sustain compassion, especially if there's, you know, hardness that you experience. And now, I I don't know that, in fact, I'm going to say there is a principle in Scripture that sometimes you do what you can, and if there's not a response, we're free in Christ to not give that situation as much attention as maybe we were. That if there's not an obvious door of receptivity, um, there may come a time where, you know, we, we put our, our attention and resources elsewhere. But we're not going to say that you, you have to get right in the face of someone who is hard and wicked and somehow beat their, their door down. But you know, as we interact with people who are hurting, people who have sinned, been sinned against, can become difficult. Now, we do need to remember, you know, God's love is in harmony with God's truth. So again, I'm not... I'm not saying that we should uh, view people's sin as acceptable, which is becoming common these days. Or even there's a term that's out there that I think is actually really dangerous, and I've heard it a lot lately. Have you ever heard this idea of your truth or her truth? She's just speaking her truth. I understand to a point, like if you say, okay, everyone has their experience or their point of view, Yes, let's be humble and listen to what they say that they've gone through or something like that. We can be humble in listening to, to their stories. But the idea that truth is relative and it changes based on the situation and the person, that's not just dangerous, that's just wrong. So we're not saying to begin uh, imbibing the world's philosophies in this. God's love is in harmony with God's truth. But... This is the example that Jesus sets before us when the question is asked, who is my neighbor? A lot of you probably have J.C. Ryle. How many of you have J.C. Ryle's like four-volume red hardback copy on the Gospels, expository thoughts on the Gospels? Anybody have that? That's kind of a classic. You should. Um, it's very, it, a lot of it is very devotional. In fact, we've actually read it for family devotions at times. This is J.C. Ryle on this, on this passage, on this um, parable. And by the way, I thought it was interesting that, uh, that J.C. Ryle, um, although he was a, an Anglican pastor who died, I think he died in 1900, so he would have been ministering in the 1800s and died about 121 years ago. But he was credited with having some success, if you, you know, put it that way. God used him uh, with a measure of kingdom success in evangelizing the blue-collar community. And that just made some of these words ring a little bit more uh, true. This is what Ryle says on this passage. We have in this striking description an exact picture of what is continually going on in the world. Selfishness is the leading characteristic of the great majority of mankind. That cheap charity, which costs nothing more than a trifling subscription or contribution, is common enough. But that self-sacrificing kindness of heart, which cares not what trouble is entailed so long as good can be done, is a grace which is rarely met with. There are still thousands in trouble who can find no friend or helper, and there are still hundreds of priests and Levites who see them but pass by on the other side. Things are probably kind of similar and, you know, in our day, there are, there's a lot of talk about compassion, and there are those who truly, I think, God has used to, to minister in this way. But I think what you often find, too, is ministering like this, you know, loving, showing love in a situation that's hard, um, it, it's difficult to maintain that on your own strength over time. You know, anybody can come flying in for a couple days and do some big thing, but to, can, to have a lifestyle that is self-sacrificial, showing kindness of heart to those who are in need. That, that really is God's work in our hearts, isn't it? That's God's work in our hearts, to show that kind of love to others when it gets difficult. So closing question, I mean, who, whom has providence placed at your door? Who is your neighbor? And brothers and sisters, let's not let the current circumstances of this past year or two stop us from loving people like Jesus 
even though in some cases we might find out with a certain measure of vehemence, they don't really want us to talk about it. Maybe we have felt, like I said at the beginning, maybe we have come to feel like we were kind of hunkering down and just circling the wagons and taking care of the family of God. And, and, and some of that, need, there is a prioritization of the family of God. But brothers and sisters, in this day and age, we continue to be, uh, there, there's a need for us as the family of God to throw those doors wide open while there is yet time. And now is the day of salvation. Who has the Lord put at your door providentially? Who is your neighbor? Maybe the person that you're hesitant to interact with, but you know the Lord is prompting you to do that. Let's pray. Our Father God, even as we think about the challenges coming from a, a passage like this, sometimes perhaps our first, our first response is that we need to do better, we need to try harder. But Lord, maybe our first response is, Lord, teach us to love you with all of our hearts. And teach us with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to live out our Christianity, helping us to follow after the example of Christ and having his mind and his humility as we love those that you've providentially brought to us. So Lord, help us to seek you first. Help us to love you with all of our hearts and help us to show people Jesus by being like him as we continue to pursue after you ourselves. Lord, may we be an evangelistic congregation showing love to the lost, even at a time where it's, it's perhaps going to be more volatile. Maybe there's a measure of danger, even if nothing else, relational danger. Things might not go well, but Lord, despite the risks, give us a love, a heart, a compassion for people, recognizing what they truly need, even if maybe they don't, they're not aware of what they truly need. And Lord, may, may our hearts beat with the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.